This is the second of three lectures from Chapter 11 on Intermolecular Forces, and this lecture is going to focus on the physical properties that are affected by intermolecular forces. All right, as mentioned in the first video from Chapter 11, the melting point and boiling points are definitely affected. Um, the stronger the intermolecular attractions between molecules, the harder it is to separate them, and that's what you do when you melt or boil something. You're actually separating or loosening the intermolecular forces. Surface tension, that's what allows like paper clips and things to float on the top of water, and that's due to intermolecular attractions also. Um, basically what you have, and I'll go in more detail for each of these in the next few slides, um, but basically it makes kind of like a film on top of um, liquids. Viscosity is resistance to flow. So, for example, honey has a high viscosity, water has a lower viscosity. Um, that's a result of intermolecular attractions also. And finally, solubility. Um, you may have heard the phrase before, like dissolves like. Um, but that is related to inter intermolecular forces, how strongly molecules are attracted to each other versus some second substance. So melting and boiling points are not only dependent on the strength of the intermolecular forces, but also on the amount of kinetic energy, which is basically saying how, what the temperature it's at, um, the particles possess. There's basically a battle going on. So you have molecules, let's say water, and they have intermolecular forces with other water molecules, and those intermolecular forces hold, serve to hold them together. If you add heat, okay, you increase the temperature, you therefore increase the kinetic energy, they all start dancing and hopping around, and that loosens these intermolecular forces. So there's kind of a... Uh, push and pull going on between these two factors. So if we want to change the state of something from let's say a solid to a liquid or a gas, um, we add more kinetic energy, which means heat, all right? Until we've added enough kinetic energy so that the molecules can escape the intermolecular forces that are holding them closer together. All right, so um, increasing the kinetic energy increases the ability of the molecules to escape the hold that the intermolecular attractions have on them. And so you should be able to interpret a graph that looks somewhat like this, and this graph just shows in picture form what I just explained. So, and there is my dog view for the video. So along the x-axis, we have kinetic energy. And along the y-axis, we have the f number of molecules, okay? So, <laughs> let's say that the amount of kinetic energy that's needed for boiling or melting or whatever, so this is our target kinetic energy, okay? So we need this much before um, molecules are able to boil or melt or something. And so... Um, at the lower temperature, T1, the number of molecules having enough kin kinetic energy is represented by this black area. So there aren't very many molecules that have enough kinetic energy um, to escape, let's say we're talking about boiling, to escape the liquid to become a gas. But if we increase the temperature to T2, then... So now we're looking at this curve. The number of molecules that have enough kinetic energy increases. Okay? So just make sure you know how to interpret this type of curve in case it shows up as a test question. All right. So in order to undergo any type of phase change, you basically, well, you have to have a change in energy. Always. Okay? All right, so let's talk about the differences. We talked about it a little bit in lecture one, but let's talk about it a little bit more um, here, the differences between the three common states of matter, gas, liquid, solid, um, on a molecular level. Uh, most time in this course, we will be talking about a molecular level. 
molecules in a gas because they have very, very weak, um, almost no intermolecular attractions. So they have complete freedom of motion. The molecules in a solid, on the other hand, are, have very strong intermolecular attractions held very tightly together, and the only thing they can do is vibrate. They cannot move past one another. And the molecules in the liquid are intermediate. Um, they do have rel moderately strong intermolecular attractions. Um, they're pretty close together, but they can still slide past one another. These are the phase changes. If you've gotten rusty on terminology for any of them, you should go over them. Um, I think we're all real comfortable with vaporization, condensation, melting, and freezing. Um, sublimation, remind yourself that's when you're going directly from the solid state. Oh, that was a bad gaff, wasn't it? Directly from solid to the gas phase. Deposition, um, we go directly from the gas phase back to the solid phase. It's the reverse of sublimation. You should also be aware that uh, vaporization, melting, and sublimation are all, all require input of energy, meaning they're endothermic. And the other three, which is condensation, freezing, and deposition, are exothermic processes. I have never really been able to wrap my head around the fact of an exothermic phase change. Um, I don't think of condensation as releasing heat as it occurs, but it actually does. So um, that's, again, just a little piece of trivia you should know. All right, so the second property we're going to talk about after melting and boiling point is vapor pressure. And vapor pressure, I want to make sure you understand what it is first. In any liquid, there are a certain percentage of molecules, not the majority, there's definitely a minority, that have enough kinetic energy to escape the liquid into the gas phase. And these gas molecules, as all gas molecules, create a certain amount of gas pressure. Um, gas pressure is simply a result of gas molecules colliding with the container they're in. And this pressure exerted by these small number of gas molecules over a liquid are called vapor pressure. And so that vapor pressure is in part dependent on the intermolecular forces. So think about it. The stronger the intermolecular attraction is, the lower the vapor pressure is, okay? So as intermolecular forces, I'm going to abbreviate it from now on, goes up, as they get stronger, vapor pressure goes down. Why would that be? Well, if there's high intermolecular forces, that means that the molecules are very really tightly held together and not very many of them have enough kinetic energy to escape. So there aren't very many gas molecules. So the number of gas molecules is actually very low. Therefore, the vapor pressure is low. Looking at the other end of that, <clears throat> if you have a substance with low intermolecular forces, okay, um, obviously it's going to have a low boiling point. It's going to be easier to loosen up those forces. And, we, and it's also going to have a high vapor pressure. So let me pause for a minute. If boiling point is low, if something boils at a low temperature, that means the vapor pressure is going to be high, okay? The lower the boiling point, the more molecules will have enough energy to escape and go in the gas phase, so the vapor pressure will go up. We call these type of molecules that have low boiling points and high vapor pressures volatile. That's a vocabulary word you need to know. All right, so um, intermolecular forces affect vapor pressure. The second thing that affects it is temperature, clearly, okay? As you increase temperature, you're giving more kinetic energy to the molecules. Therefore, more of them, a higher percentage of them, can escape from the liquid phase into the vapor phase, which increases vapor pressure. All right, so be able to interpret this type of graph. This is a vapor pressure versus temperature graph. Pay attention to... The x and y axes, temperature is on the x axis, vapor pressure is on the y axis. And so in general, 
So as temperature increases, what's happening to vapor pressure? It's also increasing. That would make sense, right? Give more kinetic energy, more molecules escape into the gas phase, increasing vapor pressure. Okay? And just a little tidbit here that you need to know. There's something magical about this horizontal line. It's right at 760 millimeters of mercury, which is the same thing as Tor. Okay? And if you don't remember, that happens to be atmospheric pressure, the pressure we're under right now. And it turns out that when the vapor pressure of a substance equals atmospheric pressure, that temperature is the boiling point. Okay? So the boiling point of diethyl ether is 34.6 Celsius. Boiling point of ethanol, 78.3. And of course, the boiling point of water is 100 degrees. So again, let me say that again slowly. When the vapor pressure exerted by a liquid equals the pressure exerted in our atmosphere, which is 760, when those two are equal, the temperature at which that occurs is the boiling point of a substance. So basically, let's imagine we have a beaker full of water. That water has a certain vapor pressure, okay, depending on the temperature that it's being heated at, and our atmosphere always exerts a certain pressure equal to 760 torr. When we raise the temperature enough so that the vapor pressure of this liquid equals 760, that's our boiling point. And for water, we know we have to heat it up to 100 degrees Celsius in order to reach that point. Alrighty, so, um, whoops, it's kind of redundant, isn't it? Okay, well, that's exactly what I just said, but there you have it again if you want to read it in words. All right, so official definitions, boiling point of a liquid is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of that substance equals the atmospheric pressure, which at sea level of 760 torr. Okay. When you see a phrase normal boiling point, that means under normal conditions, which is one atmosphere or, again, that equals 760 torr. Okay. That's normal. So you need to get used to that terminology. Um, that is because if we are at a different pressure, let's say instead of one atmosphere, we're at 1.2 atmosphere, the boiling point's going to change. Okay, And that's why if you go to some place like Denver um, with a low um, atmospheric pressure, your water's not going to boil at 100. It might boil at 92 degrees or something. So boiling point is dependent on the pressure at which you're at. All right, so just to make sure you kind of followed what I was saying, um, turn my voice off now and see if you can identify the boiling points for these substances. And see if you can identify the one in the black line. And then turn me back on and I will explain the answer. All right, so if you have a graph like this, pressure graph, the first thing you want to do is find atmospheric pressure, which is 760. So here's 700. So 760, yeah, roughly there. And so these top data points probably represent the boiling point. And so just take them down and see what temperature they correspond to. Oh, I'm bad at drawing a straight line. No. So that one may be around 35 degrees Celsius. And this blue one is right on the line. Yay. So that's around 80 degree Celsius boiling point. And this black one, 100 degrees. So of course, the 100 degree one is water. Okay, so that's all you would need to be able to do with these graphs. All right, so... I already showed you this too. See, when I'm making these PowerPoints, I'm scared that I'm not going to get my point across, so I get very redundant, and this is a, a perfect example of me being redundant. So, but this was that graph. I won't go through the agonizing thing again, but this was the graph that basically said 
um, if you increase temperature, so if you're at a higher temperature, that is the red outline curve, then the fraction of molecules that have enough kinetic energy um, to escape and become gases is higher. All right, now we're going to get into some calculations. They're actually pretty easy, um, but there's terminology you need to be familiar with, which I think you should be a little bit familiar with it from last semester, and that is the delta H sign, which is technically enthalpy, but it, some people just call it heat instead because at constant pressure, heat and enthalpy are the same thing. So um, we're going to learn how <clears throat> uh, to calculate heat of vaporization. Um, first of all, keep in mind that vaporization is always endothermic. It always requires input of energy. Therefore, the mathematical sign of heat of vaporization is always positive. Remember, if something's endothermic, it'll have a positive delta H, and if it's exothermic, it'll have a negative. Um, okay, so these two are the same thing, right? Condensing is just the reverse of vaporization, so those two values are the same except for their sign. Vaporization would be endothermic and condensation would be exothermic. All right, so let's look at the values for a minute. Um, these are comparing four different substances, and this tells you something about the energy required to vaporize, okay, or to boil. Okay, so which one of these requires the most energy to boil? Okay, it's isopropyl alcohol. Okay, water's up there pretty close too. And that's completely dependent on the intermolecular forces. We know by now, hopefully, that water has pretty strong intermolecular forces. It can hydrogen bond, and so can rubbing alcohol, by the way. Um, and so they have a higher heat of vaporization. Um, you will be working with and need to get familiar with something called a heating curve. Again, you may have gone over it briefly last semester. But basically, it is a graph of temperature on the y-axis and the amount of heat, usually in joules or kilojoules, added to a substance. Okay? And what it tends to look like, it has some sloped areas. Okay? No surprise, you would expect the temperature to go up as you add heat to something, right? And then it has some plateaus, which may be a surprise because, wait a minute, as you're adding heat to something, shouldn't the temperature always go up? Why is the temperature staying constant here? Um, so that's part of what we're going to be talking about. The plateau areas represent phase changes, and during a phase change, all of the heat is going into, all the heat energy is going into loosening the intermolecular forces, um, and so the temperature doesn't change while you're undergoing a phase change. Once all of it has boiled off, though, the temperature can go up again, and that's really why a steam burn, okay, this is the gas phase now, that's really why a steam burn is so much more dangerous than a boiling water burn because steam can get hotter than 100 degrees. Okay, so this is just another segment of the curve. This just shows melting, same type of pattern as boiling. Um, let's say we have ice at negative 10 degrees, frozen, it's a solid. Um, the temperature increases as we add heat, just like you'd expect, until we reach a phase change, which the first one would be melting, at which the temperature remains constant. Once it's all melted, the temperature can increase again until we reach the next phase change. Okay, so here's a picture of the whole composite heating curve. Okay. Obviously, you can have a cooling curve. <laughs> you could go the other direction and... Um, Start with something that's a gas and start cooling it. Okay, so uh, you may not see one of those, but just in case you do, it doesn't throw you off too much. So again, all the plateaus represent phase changes. Okay, and there are separate calculations for, I call each of these legs. There's one, two, three, four, five separate legs on a heating curve or segments. How's that? <clears throat> All right, so the sloped areas represent one single phase, gas, oh my, I've really made some goofs here, sorry. This is a solid phase, and here's the gas, and here's the liquid. 
All right, so, and the plateaus, whoopee, the plateaus are a mixture of the two phases that are um, undergoing a phase change. So this first plateau is a mixture of solid and liquid. And the second plateau is a mixture of gas and vapor. And the plateaus represent, I didn't have that. There are two types of calculations you do for a heating curve. Um, there's one that you use for the sloped areas, okay, only the sloped areas. And that I call it the QMCAT equation because that delta looks kind of like an A, but it's not really. QMCAT equation. And what that is, that tells you that the amount of heat, which is Q, equals the mass of the sample in grams times something called the specific heat capacity, which we'll talk about, times the change in temperature that it has experienced. Okay, So you can use a QMCAT formula for any sloped area, this segment or this segment. You may not use it for the plateau area simply because in the plateau areas delta T is zero, okay? So you wouldn't get anything out of it anyway. So what is specific heat? Okay, Specific heat is the amount of energy required to increase one gram of a material by one degree Celsius. Okay, so look at the units. Joules per grams times Celsius. These are both in the denominator. Okay, um, so again, it's the amount of energy, which is in joules, required to increase the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. So what does that say? That basically says if you apply the same amount of heat to different substances, their temperature is going to change by different amounts depending on the composition of the, of the substance. Um, and you kind of already know that. If you have a piece of styrofoam and a piece of metal outside on a hot summer day and you go and put your hand on each of them, that hot metal is going to be, or excuse me, that metal is going to be really, really hot and the styrofoam probably won't feel hot at all. That's because the specific heat of metal is very low, which means it requires not very much heat to increase the temperature of metal. Okay, So the higher the specific heat, that means the more heat is required to change the temperature. The higher the specific heat of a substance, the more heat you have to put in to get any temperature change. All right, so so let's look at this curve. What if you saw a curve like this and I asked you to determine which phase has the highest specific heat? Well, first of all, where do we see phases? Oops, let me change that to red. Here's the solid phase, here's the liquid phase, and here's the gas phase. How do you tell by looking at those which one may have the highest specific heat? Well, what does that mean again? Let's look at the units, joules per gram per degree Celsius, okay? So the one with the highest specific heat requires the most, this would have to, joules would have to be large in the numerator, requires the most input of heat to get any temperature change. So how much input of heat do you have in this very sharp slope? Oh, not very much, okay? This tiny little bit of heat is all you had to add to get what temperature change did we see? 50 degrees. That's not very much heat. That's very low amount of heat. <coughs> so the, the solid phase, I would say, has a low specific heat. The um, liquid phase, how much heat do we have to put in? Well, maybe we started at 8 joules and ended at, what, 15 joules? So maybe we put in 7 joules of heat to get 100 degrees. 
So let's say seven jewels in this one. Um, one, one to two, okay? So obviously the liquid has a higher specific heat value. So basically the more, uh, what kind of slope is that? Not sharp, broader, what do you call that? Lower slope, <laughs> okay? Lower slope, okay. The higher the specific heat capacity it means you needed more heat, okay? Heat is on the x-axis. All right. And here are the actual values. Okay, so of course the heat capacity of water is higher than the heat capacity of frozen water or boiled water. Okay, which just means it's harder to change the temperature of liquid water than it is the other two phases. All right, so here's an example of the type of calculation you're going to need to be able to do. Um, this is perfectly set up for um, a QMCAT <clears throat> calculation. Okay, it's saying how much heat. Remember, heat is Q. Gives you the mass in grams. Um, you would have to be given specific heat capacity of the substance. Um, you'll come to memorize the heat, specific heat capacity of water, which is 4.184, but you don't need to right now. Temperature change. Okay, delta T. All right, then you just plug in your values, okay? Just remember temperature change is final temperature minus initial. Um, final temperature, you got to read the wording, is 5 degrees, okay? Plug in the QMCAT, and we have found that the heat is 34,000 joules, okay? It is heat that is given off. Something is cooling, which means it's given off heat. That is an exothermic process, therefore the negative sign. All right, so we've talked about how to calculate heat um, for the sloped areas of our heating curve. How do you calculate heat transferred for the plateau areas when we're undergoing a phase change? It's a different formula, okay? Um, it's actually easier. It's just um, an easier formula to use. So basically, you can't use QMCAT on the plateaus. So before I give you the formula, I need you to understand a couple of vocabulary terms. Something called heat effusion. Again, it's really enthalpy effusion, delta H, but commonly called heat effusion. First thing I want you to understand is fusion means is associated with melting. I don't know why they don't call it heat of melting, but heat of fusion um, is the amount of heat required to melt something. Uh, heat of vaporization is the amount of heat required to boil or vaporize something. So those are things you can find in a reference table. You would be have to be given that information. It's a constant. So the formula you need is really simple. Q, or the amount of heat um, transferred during a plateau, is equal to delta H times the amount of grams. Now pay attention for a minute because... Delta H, the heat of fusion or heat of vaporization, can have two different units. Sometimes it's joules per gram, sometimes it's joules per mole. So if you're trying to get just joules, which is the unit for heat, pay attention to the units of delta H. If it's per gram, you need to multiply by the number of grams you have. If it's per mole, multiply by the number of moles, and that will give you, obviously, joules. All right, just kind of a little tidbit. Again, it might be like a multiple choice question. The heat of vaporization is always much larger than the heat of melting or the heat of fusion, okay? It takes a whole lot more energy to vaporize something than it does to melt it. That might be a short essay question. Why do you think that is? Why does it take more energy to vaporize something than to melt it? you've got to think on a molecular level. If you're melting something, you're just slightly loosening the intermolecular forces, okay? Going from a solid to a liquid. If you're vaporizing something, you're completely separating the molecules and you're essentially breaking the intermolecular forces. So you need to put a lot more energy into boiling than into melting. Here we go. All right, so these calculations are not hard. They're tedious, and there are a zillion places to make silly little errors, so it's probably a good idea to check your work. 
you are often given an entire heating curve for a substance. This is for water. How do I know that right away? Because the first plateau occurs at zero degrees, which is the freezing point of water. Second plateau occurs at 100 degrees, which of course is the boiling point of water. So you can tell what substance you're dealing with by looking at the temperature that the plateaus occur. Here's the question. We're starting with 18 grams of ice. Of course, we're going to need to know the mass. And we're starting at a temperature, <clears throat> this should be minus 25 degrees. If it's ice, it's got to be below zero. And we're heating, provide enough heat to go all the way to 125 degrees steam. You are going to do five calculations, okay? Do not make the novice error of saying, okay, here's my temperature change, I'll just use QMCAT. No, 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 no. You have to do a separate calculation for each segment in this heating curve, okay? One for this, one for this, that, that, and that. That is five calculations, so I'm going to walk you through those. All right, so on the first segment of the heating curve, that's right here, where the temperature is changing, we can use QMCAT. So, and I gave you the specific heat capacity of ice. Make note of the fact that the specific heat capacity of a substance is different depending on what state of matter it's in. So the specific heat capacity is different for ice versus liquid water versus steam. Um, all right. We know what the mass is, 18 grams. I just gave you the specific heat capacity. What is the temperature change? Well, you only want the temperature change for this sloped area. So it goes from minus 25 up to 0 degrees. Okay? 0 degrees is our final temperature. 25 is our initial. You get 941 joules of heat is required to get 18 grams of water to this point. Okay, um, you'll see when you get to the plateaus, you end up with kilojoules as units. So I usually just convert them as soon as I get everything to kilojoules. So at the end, I have them on the same units. Alrighty, um, we're on to the second leg, second segment of that, which is the first plateau. That's occurring at zero degrees, and that is the melting point. We use then the Q heat equals how much we have times delta H of fusion. Fusion because we're melting. Um, the, the value they gave you for delta H, remember I said the, the units can change, is per mole, not per gram. So you need to get this 18 grams into moles. Divide by the molar mass of water. That's nice. It's exactly one mole. Then plug into this formula. We then learned that the heat required to completely melt all 18 grams of water is 6.02 kilojoules. Now we're going to move on to segment three, which is raising the temperature of liquid water from zero degrees to 100 degrees. So we're going to do that next. And here we go. It's a sloped area, so we can use QMCAT again. The heat capacity of liquid water is 4.18. So all we need to do at this point is plug in grams, specific heat capacity. Final temperature is 100 because at that point we were going to reach a plateau. Initial was zero, <clears throat> 7.52 kilojoules to raise the temperature. All right, now we're on to the fourth calculation, which is now boiling off 18 grams of water. So we are right here. We're at 100 degrees, okay? And we want to know the amount of heat required to boil all this water off. So we're going to use the Q equals amount of substance we have times heat of vaporization. Oopsie. All right, so the heat of vaporization um, of water is really high. Remember I said how it takes a lot more energy to vaporize something than to melt it? 40.7. So now we just plug in. We already know we have one mole. We converted it on a previous step. And so the heat required to boil off all that water is 40.7. That's a lot 
That's the biggest value so far. On to the last calculation. Now we're on to, we've boiled it all off, and now we have steam, okay? So we're starting at a temperature of 100, and the problem tells us how high they want to heat it to. It wants to heat it to 125 degrees Celsius, so we can use QM cap, okay? Um, 18 grams, specific heat capacity of steam is 2.01, and final temperature we're going to is 125, and 0.904 kilojoules. Yay! So now you have values. Put them, make sure you have them all in the same units. I think I left one off, didn't I? I think I left the very last one off. So that raising the temperature of steam was 0.904 kilojoules. So I'm not sure if I included the 0.904 when I added them all together. So if this is wrong, just add 0.904 to it. And so that's the final answer. Just add all the steps together. I know this is a really long lecture. We're almost done, okay? Now we're going to learn about phase diagrams, okay? They kind of look to me like a crooked Y, like if you're singing the song YMCA. Um, Okay, and you need to be able to identify the different regions of this. I call it the slug diagram. Solid is to the left, liquid is in the middle, and gases are to the right. Um, and what this phase diagram does is it shows you um, the phases of matter that are pres present at different pressures and temperatures along the x-axis. So as you vary temperature and pressure, you can affect the phase of matter. Okay. We're real familiar with changing temperatures. We know that if you heat something up, you might um, melt something or boil something. Um, but you may not know that if you change the pressure, if you lower the pressure, something you can cause something to boil at room temperature, for example. So it's kind of cool. So every substance has its own unique phase diagram. These lines represent phase changes. Okay, So this line represents the change I like to call it the melting line, okay? Represents going from a solid to a liquid. The line on the far right, um, you can think of vaporization or boiling line, okay? And going at the very bottom, this little leg down here goes from a solid directly to a gas. That's the subliming line, okay? So here are all of them labeled for you. Um, there are a couple of special points that you need to know about, and one is the triple point. I don't know if you ever did that lab in high school where you put a little bit of dry ice in a disposable pipette and seal it off, and you can actually see the liquid face of dry ice, and then the pipette blows up in your hand. It was a fun lab. Anyway, so triple point. What is the triple point? That is the temperature and pressure at which all three states of matter exist at the same time. Okay, so it's pretty cool. So you would go over and find the pressure and then go down and find the temperature and that would tell you the triple point. Okay, critical point, I have never completely wrapped my head around this even though I've read about it quite a bit. It is the point at the very tippy top of the far right vaporization curve. Okay, and I think the most sensical thing that I can tell you about that is if you get above the critical temperature, so this would be the critical temperature. If you get above that, um, remember this is a gas phase. The gas cannot be made to turn back into a liquid no matter how much pressure you may add to it. Okay. Normally, if you have a gas, let's say here at this temperature, and you increase pressure, you can make it condense to a liquid, right? If we have a gas at this temperature, we increase pressure, we can make it be a liquid. If you get beyond the critical point and you increase pressure, it's going to stay a gas, okay? So that's probably the most important thing about it for you to know. So you will probably be asked to interpret a phase diagram. So here's a typical type question that I might ask. I might say, let's say you have a substance at atmospheric pressure, 
which is one atmosphere, and at minus 25 degrees, and you increase temperature. I might say, what would happen? Well, you'd have to increase temperature, which means moving horizontally. And what just happened? We just underwent a phase change. So first you would say, okay, it would melt. What temperature would it melt at? Well, you'd have to go down here at zero degrees Celsius. Then if you continued to increase temperature, you would eventually undergo another phase change and it would boil. And what temperature would it boil at 100 degrees? Okay. So that would be one question. Another question might be, let's say I started with a substance at atmospheric pressure and 25 degrees Celsius and I decreased pressure on it. So you start going down in pressure. Remember, pressure is on the y-axis until you see something change. There we go. What just happened? I went from a liquid to a gas. What is that called? Vaporization. But I did it by decreasing pressure, not by increasing temperature. Okay? It's a really cool demo. I don't know if you've ever seen it. But you can put a glass of room temperature water in a vacuum and it'll boil at room temperature. It's pretty cool. All right, the last property that I'm going to talk about and the very end of this lecture, yay, is surface tension. So surface tension is what allows you to float like a paper clip or something kind of light on the surface of water. And you can kind of think of surface tension as almost like a film that some liquids make, and it's due to intermolecular attractions. So I like to look at it like this. Let's imagine that this, these are water droplets on a car, okay? And water has very strong intermolecular forces, a hydrogen bonds, so they're all really strongly attracted to each other. And then you have these air molecules, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, you have all sorts of air molecules that can't hydrogen bond and water just is not nearly as attracted to these air molecules as it is to itself. So it actually curves around trying to associate only with other water molecules and really tries to get away um, from the other molecules that it, that it doesn't have a strong attraction to. And so that's surface tension, okay? It, and it makes almost like a, a barrier on the surface. And so, again, it depends on the strength of the intermolecular forces. Um, I lied. Okay, capillary action. Um, you probably know if you take a little tube that's open on both ends and you put it in some water, the water's going to automatically um, suck up, <laughs> uh, draw itself up that tube. And that's called capillary action. And that's basically because the water is very attracted to the molecules that make up the glass. Okay? Um, two more vocabulary words. Cohesion means molecules are attracted to themselves. Adhesion um, means molecules are attracted to something else. Okay? That's how glue works. It makes the molecules in the glue attracted to whatever you're putting it on. Okay? Um, so we know that water molecules, which are very polar, are attracted to the molecules that make up glass, which happens to be silicon dioxide. They're also very polar. So they have very strong intermolecular attractions with each other, which is why you get capillary action. That's the same reason you get a meniscus. I'm sure in your lab, when you've done titrations or you read the volume in a graduated cylinder, you have this little curved surface of water. That's not all liquids do that, but water and glass definitely does that. And again, that's capillary action on the sides. Okay, water um, is very attracted to the glass sides and it makes that curved surface. Mercury is really weird. It actually goes down in glass. It doesn't like glass at all. So that um, does it. This is the very last slide. 
and I really lied, this is yet another property, viscosity. And viscosity is the resistance of a liquid to flow. So honey is more viscous than water. The stronger the intermolecular forces of attraction, the greater the viscosity, the greater the resistance to flow. You can break up that viscosity by heating something. So if you heated honey, you could make it less viscous. So viscosity is dependent on temperature. Um, this chart down at the bottom just gives you an idea of how viscosity can change. Um, these are all very similar structure molecules. They're all hydrocarbons. They're all nonpolar. So they all have only London dispersion forces, right? Because they're nonpolar. So it's a relatively weak force. But remember that the strength of a London dispersion force goes up as the size of the molecule goes up. Okay. So you would expect as the size of these molecules goes up, viscosity go up. And guess what? It does. Okay. So viscosity correlates with the strength of intermolecular forces. That is it. Sorry for how long this one is. The third and last lecture in Chapter 11 is on solids, which will be the shortest one.